Okay, so I guess I think I'm recording this. Today is the demystification of pious fraud. And when we're talking about pious fraud, I'm saying that we can prove this so it's not like a baseless allegation or a loosely founded insinuation. We're talking about very basic, very basic pious fraud. So most people know about all the religions that have a virgin birth in the uh, in the telling of them and in their stories. Uh, so, but I'm not doing that, so I'm not listing all those. You can uh, find that in John G. Jackson's book, uh, the pagan uh, the pagan origins of Christianity. I don't think that's the exact name, but close enough, you'll find it. John G. Jackson, the pagan, or the pagan origins of Christianity. Yeah, I think it is the pagan origins. Anyway, I'm going to be showing you where all those religions got that. Like, well, why did they have that in there? Where does it come from? What's going on? It's very simple. It's very basic. The virgin birth is a very basic and primary component of the pantheon of time associated with the temple and is a pretty easy thing to do, uh, both with sources and modern examples and uh, personal examples of people born in the time because it's a specific 10-day time period. And we're going to do that. Pious fraud. So here's the sources. I'm using the I Ching the uh, Deccan number 16 of the Hindu, uh, 36 views of Mount Fuji, view number 15, Genesis, of course, Genesis follows the Deccans all the way around to number 36 and then continues to number 14, which makes a total of 50 chapters. Uh, numbers also follows the 36 Deccans. That's 36 chapters long, precisely, but it's really kind of... Uh, I mean, Numbers is just a destroyed book. It, there is some stuff in there, uh, but I just, I'm not going to go there for this. I don't need it. I mean, we could. I can go all the way through and use the New Testament also. I'm not going to do that. We don't need it. Uh, I'll do the New Testament later on. That'll be a whole series in and of itself. This is part one in a series of pious fraud, because specifically what we're doing is I'm alleging that the Catholic Church knows these things, and this is the source for what everybody has used throughout millennia, and uh, they're no different. So this is where they got it. This is what they're using, and I think we're going to be able to very easily show this. Uh, I'm also going to use the Lesser Tarot, Pamela Coleman-Smith, for Pentacles. I'll explain a little bit about where she got all that. And the Zodiac of Dendera, which was one of the premier calendars of the Earth. And uh, we'll mix in a little Aztec sunstone, but it's not a primary component. Now, just to show also that there is another source that I do not have the information from because I need to go back down there. I need to get back to Guatemala. I've got some people I'm talking to down there, but they're very hard to get a hold of. And you have to go down there. You can't just call them on the phone, and it's just not that easy. So, And also, this is very, uh, in U.S. academia, they call it altar five. It's not an altar. I've seen this stone in Tikal. That is a 36 decan calendar. They know it. I know it. Everybody knows it, except, apparently, academia. They think they used it for an altar. They like to say those things, but it's not true. Virgin Deccan in the Hindu is represented by this image. Uh, this image is sourced from Das Indisch Horoskop. Uh, Marlena Kruger uh, was published in, I think, 1972. Quote me on that, might have been 71. Uh, has many, has a big long descriptor, but these basic descriptors are actually from uh, the Bhagavad Gita. And they are very short, and those are the ones I prefer because they're extremely accurate, and that's all you need to know. 
This is a virgin girl carrying a container filled with flowers, dressed in dirty clothes. She desires clothes, wealth, and marriage. And she is on her way to the teacher's house, which is the temple. And in the temple, there is a little hooded figure behind her in the temple. And we'll get into all that. But there's the basic Hindu image. These images are extremely important, very, very accurate. They show a lot of things because there's hand positions, arm positions, there's clothed, unclothed, she's removing her veils, you've got the double pillars, you've got the roof, you got a it's on and on and on. There's nothing wasted in these images. Personal example, the only one I'm going to use until the end, is Mother Teresa, the most famous nun in the Catholic Church. The most famous one. The most famous one is born on August 25th in Virgin Deccan. So anybody who doesn't uh, understand why she's the most famous nun, maybe now you do. She raised a lot of money for the church. And the church doesn't exactly, if anybody's familiar with church finances, uh, they don't exactly give all their money to charity now, do they? No, they don't. Uh, so I just wanted to point out the hypocrisy because people like to put her pictures up with these quotes. And there's a ton of hypocrisy in this stuff, which really infuriates me when you understand the pious fraud involved with Virgin Deacon and Mother Teresa and the church as a whole. If you judge people, you have no time to love them. Well, that's all the church does is judge people, and that's all they teach about is judgment day. So if, if it's wrong to judge people, then what's going to happen to judgment day? Why is, you know, why are they telling us that God is judging us and all this stuff? So obviously that's a, that just blows me away right there. But then there's the other one. It is a poverty to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish. Really, I think you should inform the uh, cardinals and the bishops who are you know, very much enjoying all the money pouring in there and all the lawyers making billions of dollars off of the lawsuits from the child abuse scandals. Are you kidding me? It's a money laundering global operation. Are you kidding me? Of course it's a poverty to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish, but I'm very perplexed as to how that applies to the church because from my perspective, uh, they've got some pretty cozy digs. <laughs> Number 15 by Hakuse shows the plowed earth uh, Mount Fuji is very far in the background. It's stable, which means it's dark color, right? Got the snow cap. Mount Fuji is very stable. It's not smoking. It's not blowing up. There's not volcanic ash spitting out all over the place. It's just sitting there. It's nice and stable, isn't it? Virgin Deccan is very stable. It's the plowed earth, the freshly plowed earth that's going to produce fruit, just like a young virgin's womb is ready to be fertilized, it's ready to be seeded, it's ready to, uh, these guys aren't harvesting, although there are some, there's some wheat stacks there, but that doesn't fit with the, uh, that doesn't fit with the plowed earth, does it? So the wheat stacks are indicative of already harvested, but the, but the line, the striations in the ground, very important and a very consistent, uh, symbol in this decan. Uh, even the fog and the color of it are important, and uh, you can study this picture all you want. I'll show it later. The important thing is that you know, when you're looking at the, uh, the views of Mount Fuji by Hokuse, he lists a location for each one. So this is in Shimo Maguru. Don't quote me on the pronunciation, but so I said, well, let's look at the location because it's pretty much going to be guaranteed that's a temple. So Shimo Maguru is definitely a temple. It's not just a temple. It is a temple where they may or may not teach and likely do teach the Lotus Sutra, which is the higher learning in Buddhism. Uh, there's um, tertons that might come through here, tertons or this sect of Buddhism. Uh, so it's a very specific Buddhist temple. It's old. It's, um, this is where... It's located. 
And in the chapter 24 of the Lotus Sutra, we have a uh, basically what amounts to a reference to the 36 decans, although they only reference 34. There could be a lot of reasons why they're saying 34 instead of 36. But generally speaking, everybody knows there's 36 decans. A lot of times they'll list 32, sometimes they list 34, sometimes it's 33. Uh, the four extra decans are sometimes omitted completely or partially. So I'm just guessing that's one of their little ways of keeping secrets. They just listed 34 in that chapter, but with different forms. And that is the importance here is that Hakuse listed the number 15 view in this location where this temple is. Okay. In Genesis, it's chapter 15. Uh, this is the chapter where the word of the Lord came to Abraham, not a dude. The dudes didn't show up. It wasn't three dudes. It wasn't one dude. It wasn't an angel. It wasn't God. It was the word of the Lord came to him in the vision and says, hey, don't worry about nothing. I'm going to take care of you. I've got a great reward for you. It's like, whoa, a big reward. So he says, whoa, what are you going to give me? <laughs> this, this isn't really humble, is it? It's like, you know, you know, if you're reading a story about a guy who finally got to talk to uh, what people might perceive as God, and they say, well, what are you going to give me? You know, that's not a very, right? It's kind of a, oh, oh, it's a little, kind of an arrogant response. But he said, I don't have any children. And look at the steward of my house is this dude. He says, look, I got no no seed. Nobody's born in my house that's mine. So he wants children, right? He wants family. He wants marriage. He doesn't have a wife. He wants some land. So it goes on to talk about how he's going to get all this land and he's going to have all these children, right? Look at how many, look how many seeds you're going to get. They're like the stars. You're going to get, whoa, you're going to get, they're going to come out of your bowels. So, this is the promise of, I'm going to give you some children, I'm going to get you some land, I'm going to get you some stuff. Later on in the chapter, uh, it actually gets into, well, now we're going to do like some animal sacrifices. Why well, it's like, well, how do I get all this stuff? It's like, well, you got to do an animal sacrifice. So you're going to take up these animals and you're going to chop them up. Now, I didn't list that part because I'm not sure if YouTube allows me to uh, publish like specific animal sacrifice spells for the purpose of getting a wife and a child. Uh, but in the spell that God wants him to do, he suggests a heifer of three years old. Now, remember, a heifer is a cow that's never had a calf. So it's basically a virgin cow and a she goat of three years old. So they're talking about taking some animals, some female animals that have never had given birth and using those and then a ram and a turtle dove and a pigeon, you know, and all that stuff that could all be taken differently when you understand the other cycle is being explained in here, but these, that right there is a magic spell using virgin animals. And we're going to chop them up and then we're going to get some kids. That's what's going on there. But either way, the main thing is the first three verses are basically describing what virgin decan is after. In the I Ching, uh, this is where it gets really interesting because in the I Ching, it's actually called Zin. The hexagram for virgin decan is actually called Zin. So I've always, whenever I see this, I say, I laugh and I say, wow, that's, that's the original Zin. Uh, the original Zin is the girl who is finally has her, uh, you know, bloodletting ceremony during intercourse. Uh, but in it, they see a prince who secures the tranquility of the people. Uh, it gets into a lot of symbolism, and I could go through the entire 
hexadrama. I'm not going to do that for the purpose of this. What's really important is that we point out two very specific important things contained in this hexagram along with the order of it, which is uh, there's a marmot advancing, appearance of advancing, but like a marmot. Uh, the position is one of peril. Okay, so that's something important to pay attention to. And then you see in line three, the subject is trusted by all. Now, who didn't trust Mother Teresa? I mean, come on. Who doesn't trust a nun, right? Uh, yeah, and then in line two, it talks about getting the great blessing from his grandmother. So down in the notes, they kind of dissect this because the I Ching is really patriarchally uh, based. They're they're big, it's a very male dominant society, the feudal system, long, long ago. So they don't really mention women too much. Sometimes you have to dig. But in the notes, there it is. We're talking about the wife of imperial heaven, uh, the imperial mother, or the motherly king. So we're talking about the most highest ranking mother in all the pantheon of time. Uh, that's the big point to see here in Zen hexagram. So uh, that's that's pretty out there because you won't see that in any other I Ching descriptor for any of the other hexagrams where they're talking about the motherly king, imperial mother, or the wife of imperial heaven. So. There it is, the great ancestress of the human race. So we're talking about a woman who has the babies of all the people in the world. This is the virgin, okay? Now, when we're talking about the marmot, what I'm saying is in the Hindu uh, images, it's a very interesting thing to note that there's a hooded figure in the temple uh, that she's going to and that hooded figure is what amounts to be a second person in one of the images of the decans. Now, you will not find that in any of the other images of the decans. You will find decans in animal form where they have a, a second uh, animal in the uh, decan images. Like elephant decan has a ram that he's got his arm around. That's his little friend. And then in Lion Decan, he's got an opposition force, which is a, de a stag. But in uh, none of them, which depict purely human forms, have two humans in them. Only this one. And it's very specific. It's a hooded, the black robe in the temple. So this isn't rocket science. This isn't grade school, but it's not rocket science either. But the only reason you need grade school for this stuff is because of all this stuff people have crammed down your brain for a couple thousand years because this stuff was known all across the world. It's not, it's not complicated stuff. It's very, very basic knowledge. Okay. Here's the first deco and a Virgo in the, uh, in the, in the Lesser Tarot, now the thing about the Lesser Tarot is, what a lot of people may not know, is they'll all say, oh yeah, that was the Order of the Golden Dawn, they're a bunch of witches and all that. Okay, so Gandhi was actually in uh, London at the time when this whole group got going. So Gandhi may have, and he was very schooled in the Hindu stuff, but he may have well, he may well have had, and he did join their little order and stuff like that while he was going to college trying to pass his bar exam. Gandhi was a dude who got a lot of stuff done. So it wouldn't surprise me if some of this knowledge was actually filtered from the Hindu into the uh, British culture at the time because the, there was a group of people who were seeking to revive ancient knowledge and they had these little orders, little groups of things, and Gandhi did meet with them and did join, and he was there. And then later on, Pamela Coleman Smith comes out of the same place as an artist. She was contracted to do these images, so she did a decent job. It's not great. I mean, Hakusei and the Hindu images and the I Ching are 
you know, completely different class of sets of images, but she didn't do a horrible job. You can, you can definitely see them. They're easy to order. Uh, and there's the four of pentacles and look at the arm, the arm, uh, movements and he's got a crown. So he's a prince or over here, he's a knight, which is the, the knight of pentacles is actually the card for the entire sign of Virgo. But the first decan of Virgo is symbolized by this, uh, guy wrapped up with, uh, pretty fits the, uh, I Ching descriptor pretty good. Uh, and of course, you see the repetitive cloud ground whenever you're talking about Virgo or virgins. You're talking about freshly plowed ground and fertile land. It is the mutable earth sign. So it is the fertile ground. In the Dendera, this is the uh, zodiac of Dendera. If, they, if it's not displayed this way with the woman in full view like this, it's not being displayed properly. So this is the proper full display of the zodiac of Dendera because that is a female calendar. That's the earth. That's the, that's the representation of the pantheon of time on the earth. Uh, and it's definitely a feminine sight. The males are falcon-headed, not, they're not like guys the way they are. The women are women, human women, right? So there you go, very important. But there's the location number 16, because we're talking about the order of occurrence versus the order of order. In the order of order, there's one decan before uh, number 16, which is one of the four that gets put at the end in all the other orders. But in the Dendera and in the Hindu, uh, they don't list them with the four at the end. They list them in order of occurrence, which is fine. That's There's two ways to do it. But the proper way is to list them with the four at the end, and that's the way uh, Genesis does it. That's the way almost all the other systems do it. They're in different orders, those four at the end, but they generally list them at the end. The other thing important about the Dendera is every time you see this display, there will be missing the third decan Gemini. But if you go back to the original uh, etching that Vivant Denon did before the stone was hauled to France, you will see a decan right where I've got that arrow pointing to third decan Gemini. So that's why if you count, you won't get the right count if you don't include that decan. It was now, maybe it was broke off, maybe it was taken off intentionally, it doesn't matter. It was there before the guy hauled the stone to France, which took him 20 years, and then he, he didn't get paid. Uh, now, blowing up that section where Virgin is, it's real easy to find because Virgin follows bare decan. In the order of the decans, you've got Leo, and the third decan of Leo is bear. You can go check the bear decan uh, video that I already have uploaded. I did that one first for a reason so that I could always reference it because it's very important. It's a great marker. I can use it in any time system because everybody wants to watch out for war and bear is war. So there's a lot of war. There's a lot of violence. That's not a, you know, this is, a, you have to be very careful with this decan. So, but Virgin follows it, which is very calm and, oh, now we're going to get all the stuff. Right, uh, so Virgin is the uh, first decan after Bear, going from right to left. That is a Bear, and that is Bear decan. Don't pay any attention to the Scorpion and the Lion and all that. That'll be explained later. We're talking about the decans as they go around the outside of the Dendera, and here's the Bear, there's the Virgin, there's the Quill, and there's the Swallow. And then the two decans after swallow going to the left, the first one is scales, doesn't have a face, and the second one is a falcon, which always has that little animal uh, on a leash. So there's the first two decans of Libra right after swallow, and that is definitely virgin decan. So there you go. Don't worry about the rest of it. Orders of the chapters in Genesis Number 14 is bear, and it's war. This is the war of the five armies. I mean, it is the, it's a bloody, warring chapter. 
in the very next chapter, which is virgin, well, this is Abraham. Oh, I don't have a wife. I want some babies. He's oh. like whining to God about getting some stuff. And then you have Quill. And that's the two wives fighting over a baby because he finally gets a wife. She can't have any babies. So then he gets this other lady, and they say, yeah, okay, go ahead. You can do it, you know, do it, try to have a baby with this lady. So he has a baby with that lady. Then the other wife gets mad and kicks her out of the house, and she has to go into the desert, and she gets saved and all this, you know, got to have some water, whatever. It's just, this stuff is not history. This is, this is, we're telling the pantheon of time. The two wives fighting over a baby. It's Quill. It's setting the order of the house. This is the uh, keeping track of who's what. She was asserting her dominance in the house because, well, Quill's going to set things straight. It's like, okay, so in Virgin, she didn't care, but now she's, you know, she's got a baby, but not happy with it because it's not hers. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, family. This is the, my drawing, and it's labeled here. I don't... I label it only for the purpose of explanation. Numbering the decans from Acts, it's one, two, three. Going up, Virgin is number 15, because I take the four out in this drawing. So Yogi, Jackal, Falcon, and Wagon are separated. That makes Virgin 15. That's the way it's kept in almost every single system. It's number 15. But there it is, and I'm showing you that the mother and the son, the divine birth, is an explanation of this entire pie. So when you're going through time, you're going to be in a pie. So the Catholic Church chose this one because they're in that pie, and this is what they want to do. So that's what they did, and they know this stuff, and I'm going to show you how they know it. But when you're mixing the bears and the virgins and the cross, and that's Eek, that's the 12th day, that's the cross. These are the combined calendars of the 20 days and the 32, uh, 36 decans. Eek is the symbol of the cross. And it is a, a, a time of strife. It is not an auspicious time. It is the time where these small guys come forward and all the great guys are gone. So that's what it is. That's what it talks about in the I Ching. In number 12, the great, the great guys go and the little guys come. And it's even got very specific stuff where here he comes. He's got all his companions and they're going to be with him too. So he has 12 companions, it's the 12th day, and he says, I die, I die, so I tie my fate to a bushy clump. I mean, this is pretty accurate descriptor of the story of, you know, Jesus and the anointing and all this stuff, and the virgin as his mother. She has to be his mother because there's, there, that's the way it is in time. It's going to resonate with people in their mind because they naturally, unconsciously know this stuff. And it's, it's completely natural. But there it is. There's the relationship between virgin and the child, the birth, the birth of the Son of God. He's the ordination of heaven. It's not, if he's acting in that accordance, he doesn't commit any error. And his companions come, and then he says, oh, kill me, kill me. So he's going to tie his fate to a tree. And there it is. And we're talking about ancient Maya glyphs. That's the day of the cross. Okay. And this is the combined calendars. This is how they look when you put the uh, Aztec sunstone onto the Dendera, which is where it belongs because these people were all of the same mind. They all had the same knowledge. They all shared these things. That's, in fact, where they told me they got it. So, but... There's the male and the female, one's in the east, one's in the west. And when you unify them, you get these. And I drew a little tiny line between virgin decan on the dendera and the uh, eek symbol, which is symbolized by the alligator on the old Aztec stone. They had it a little, they go back and forth on their mixture, but that's eek and that's virgin. And that you can see the proximity to them. So when you're in that pie of time, you're going to have them both. The most famous example of Virgin Deacon is born on the exact same day as Mother Teresa, but she was considered to be the most powerful woman in Vatican history. 
and she is born on August 25th. And in fact, it gets even better than that. She served under Pope Pius XII, who actually looked into the mysticism of that, of where did all this come from? What's going on? I think he wanted to out some of it. He tried to, I don't know. I don't want to give these people any credit where it may not be deserved, but it does look like he might've been battling with people to kind of get a little closer to explaining to people exactly where all this comes from and that it's not exactly true story. It's all metaphorical and it's, it's based in mysticism. So I think he didn't want to do that, but either way, that's the second most famous nun in the Catholic uh, church. And um, suffice it to say, she's one of the examples. So there you go. So Mother Teresa and Pascalina Leonard, both born on the same exact day of August 25th. And Leonard served as Pope Pius XII's housekeeper and secretary for like 40 some years. And she managed uh, the papal charity office. I mean, she, she handled the money, the parties. It, it, like this woman was the most powerful woman in the Vatican, for sure. No question. Okay. And they're both born in Virgin Deacon. And what a coincidence, they're both the most powerful and famous in the Catholic Church. Now here's the pious frauds. I know I spelled pious wrong, I did on purpose, because there's Pope Pius. Now, he wanted to, he wrote this thing called Mystic, Mystici Corporis. Okay, so the mystical of the corporeal. And this was to de-emphasize papal jurisdiction and wanted visibility, warring against uh, excessively mystical understanding of the union between Christ and church. However, warning against the mysticism is actually recognizing that it exists. They know this is a hard sell and they're, he's publishing things to kind of try to get it out, but at the same time to appease the other guys who don't want any of this stuff out because I'm going to tell you, this kind of stuff, this kind of information is kept secret in every single one of these systems. You don't just walk into uh, the room and say, hey, do you guys know about this stuff? And they just start telling you this. No, they won't. The Buddhists aren't going to do it. The Mayans aren't going to do it. I mean, the Maya will a little bit, but uh, they'll, they'll definitely give you the material. You can figure it out. But, but none of these other uh, people are going to just give this stuff away. But here it is. You know, I'm giving it away. Here you go. So, but he's also uh, responsible for moving the feast day. Hey, oh, this is, yeah. So to August 22nd. So the feast for the Queen of Heaven or the feast of the Queenship of Mary. So we're talking about making her a queen, which is a very monarchy-based right type of hierarchical uh, assignment, a, a title for monarchy. Uh, they're making a, a queenship of Mary. They moved it to August 22nd from May. So that's what they did. And there it is because they wanted to emphasize the close bond between Mary's queenship and the body and soul next to her son. So yeah, because they're right there in that same piece of pie. So Mary's called the queen of heaven, okay? That's what these people are trying to tell you to believe. They themselves know it is not true. And he moved it right to the last day. And now arguably these days can go one way or the other. I don't know if in 1969, August 22nd actually was the first day of Virgin Deacon, but if it wasn't, it was probably definitely the, the day before. He, he maintained it in a male authority uh, right before the first day of Virgin, or he actually did place it on the very first day of Virgin. Maybe it happened that night. I don't know. If they go according to the sun with the little points, I don't do that. I can usually, you can tell if you watch the news on any given day, now that we have the internet, you can tell when it changes. It doesn't always change according to the precise degree of the sun, although it, it does stick with it pretty good, but 
I don't, I don't go by that. You don't need to. You don't need any astrology. You don't need any charts. You don't need any planets. You don't need anything to study this stuff other than just basic observation of human behavior. That's all you need. And with the internet, it makes it so easy. But you can use the, uh, you can use the stars and the sun. You can. But the calendars were before those. The stars and the sun, the movements of those, and the placements of those are based on the calendars. The calendars are based on simple observation of human behavior and animal behavior. So there it is. Eat equals that equals number 12 in pi. I die, I died. So to a bushy clump, his fate does he tie. And virgin decan in Hindu is definitely the nun. And in Zin, the 35th decan, the, the, the I Ching, the first 20 are the 20 days, so uh, 21 through 56 are the decans, so number 35 would be number 15 in the proper count, Imperial Mother, it's the Imperial Mother of Heaven, the, the King's Mother, uh, and there it is, it's a very simple thing. And this is, uh, oh, this is, this is my, uh, I made this, well, I didn't make it, I, I actually had somebody make this, because I can't, I can't do this kind of thing, but I wanted to show, you can, you can pause it, just play it a couple of times, you can pause it, I'll put some sources in the descriptor, uh, the sources I listed, except the, I can't give you a source for the, uh, Hindu decans other than my own because I've only seen them in a book. So, and I've only uh, gotten them myself through another source on the internet, which is no longer there, by the way. A uh, guy passed away and his website went with him. So that's where I got them. And, um, but these are the two calendars, how they work together. So you watch at the bottom, watch at the bottom, look at the helmets going on to the dudes, look at the arrows, how perfectly they fit into the crossed arms lift at the top the overall general size these are very comparable in uh, in uh, in their actual sizes in real life this is this is very close very very close to what these actually would do if you could put them together in real life and they do work together and they do know about each other and these two things come as a pair uh, with the Maya, I think they were so devastated and torn apart that it, you know, the 36 decans did not survive as a major part of their culture. They kept the right thing, the 20 days, very, very important. Good thing they did that. Uh, the Egyptians did not keep the 20 days. They probably kept that secret, and the Romans sacked them, and they redid this calendar. So we'll get into that. The Dendera is a remake. Show you how to, we'll show you how to fix it. It's not that big of a deal. So, okay. Thank you.